Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here. Huge honor. Thank you so much for coming. Imagine yourself as an alien with an exceptionally powerful telescope just trying to understand what's going on on the planet Earth. And you come across a football match. But your telescope isn't powerful enough to see the ball. You can see players moving around, there's crowds, there's something going on, there's some sort of organization to this, but it's pretty hard to tell exactly what's going on. You can publish that in the alien journal of what's going on on the planet Earth, and a few other aliens will email you, well done. In time, alien telescopes are going to improve. And then sometimes you see new things. For example, you might see that uh, there's a per particular player in front of the goal and sometimes he falls over. You can publish that uh, again in the alien journal of what's going on on Earth. This now stimulates quite an interesting discussion at the Congress of what's going on on the planet Earth and your funding gets renewed. Alien telescopes improve yet again and now you start to see something else, which is that sometimes when the player in front of the goal falls over, the crowd starts cheering. A young alien looks at this very carefully and she observes that what seems to correlate with the person falling over, whether or not the crowd cheer, seems to correlate with something else, which is whether or not the net behind the person bulges outwards. And she has a brilliant idea, which is that what if there's a ball there, but our telescopes can't see them, can't see it? At first, you think, well, that's ridiculous. If there was a ball there, I'd see it with my epic telescope. But actually, maybe the resolution isn't quite good enough, and I can't see the ball. And then you start to think, well, what if there is a ball, and now the whole game starts to make sense? The organization of the players, the guy falls over, and whether or not the crowd cheer depends on the ball. Everything starts to make sense. So in time, the idea grows on you, and now everything, even though the telescopes never directly see the ball, postulating it's there makes everything make sense. Of course, then, you, your, the, your alien friends who postulated the ball, plus the people who helped you to push the, microscope, the, the telescopes even further advance, you all win prizes and everyone wants to be your friend. This is exactly how science works. So we're pushing forward technology, seeing things that were not, we couldn't have seen before. That opens up new ideas for what may be there to make everything work. The overarching idea would be that the ball is making everything work, even though you never directly saw it. Microscopes are, of course, the way in which we penetrate into the human body to see things that were never there before. Um, uh, back in 1665, when uh, Robert Hooke was aged 30, he published Micrographia, famously opening up uh, uh, worlds of, uh, that we never knew were there, like the flea looking, looking like this, that the, that the end of a pinhead was, was, was mountainous. But in 1872, Ernst Abbe, a mathematician, calculated that you can't make a, mic a light microscope zoom in forever. Obviously, if we have microscopes that open up new, new worlds of the human body, we should just build microscopes that are seeing better and better and better and better. But there's a fundamental physical limit which comes from the way light bends around objects. You can't build a microscope uh, that beats a fundamental law of diffraction, which is roughly speaking saying a light microscope can't be better than half the wavelength of light. So this, this is quite blue light. This is sort of yellow light, 500 nanometers. You can't get better than half of that, 250 nanometers. So there's a fundamental limit to how good a microscope can ever be. But we know that that technology will open up new worlds. There are now microscopes that beat this fundamental law of physics. And I want to sketch through the journey by which we got to those new microscopes so you understand how new technology like that really comes about. The story begins in the 1970s with Osama Shimomura and his family collecting jellyfish uh, on the San Juan Islands 90 miles off the, off the coast of, of, of Seattle. This is him with his family. These are pictures. He's since passed away. This is uh, pictures I got from his daughter there in the red jumper. Uh, this is them with their friends collecting the jellyfish. People would come up to them and say, I didn't know you could cook the jellyfish. They said, no, no, we're not eating them. We're doing scientific research. Osama Shimomura was very interested in how animals and sea creatures use color to communicate, which does not seem like he's on the path to a Nobel Prize in medicine, right? So it's curiosity-driven research. It's about how animals communicate. And he was looking at specifically how these jellyfish uh, glow green in the rim at the bottom of the umbrella uh, cup of the jellyfish. He was a certain type of scientist. He was very independent. In to, 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 he uh, grew up 
When he was age 16, he was about 15 kilometers away from the Nagasaki bomb. Um, his father was often away in the army, so he grew up to be very independently minded. When he wanted to solve this problem of how jellyfish go green, he didn't read scientific papers and then decide what to do next. He would think, what do I need? I need a juice blender to mash up the jellyfish. I need to go down to the market and look for fabric of different kinds of weave to isolate fractions of the jellyfish, uh, mashed up jellyfish to get the green glowing component. He isolated two proteins, one that takes up, uh, that when it binds to calcium gives out blue light, another one uh, gives, uh, give, takes that blue light and gives out green light, which many of you will know as green fluorescent protein. That then, when Eric Betzig in the blue shirt here read the paper uh, about green fluorescent protein, uh, he then realized that he's got to work on microscopy again because now there was a way to make that, make, use the gene for that green fluorescent protein to stick it to the gene of other proteins and produce a green tagged version of any protein uh, inside a cell and see where it goes. Eric Betzig at the time was um, uh, unemployed. He worked in Bell Labs where they developed the, the laser. It was a go-getting atmosphere, but he was fed up with science. Um, uh, but when he read that paper about green crescent protein, he decided with his friend uh, Harold uh, Hess that he wanted to get back into making a microscope that would beat this uh, fundamental law of physics. So uh, in Harold Hess's living room, um, in, in Eric's words, because Harold Hess wasn't married, um, they built the microscope that Eric had the idea for that was going to beat this fundamental law of physics. So that's it in there. It's on a cardboard box. They spent $25,000 of their own money each. Um, Harold said to me, you know, you could, you could spend that renovating a bathroom, but what's the point of that? Um, so they built the microscope, uh, and uh, it essentially, the brilliant idea is this. This is a picture of a, of a cell, and below are sort of three protein molecules within that cell that are sort of schematically shown, and the light is blurred because of the fundamental law of physics that light diffracts, it gets blurred. Eric's brilliant idea was that instead of putting a uniform, uh, a sort of high amount of light on the cell, just put a really low amount of light on the cell, and then a fluorescent molecule will switch on and give out its green color. But because there's only a few numbers of molecules being switched on, then at any one time, there would be like a flash of light from one fluorescent molecule. And although that gets blurred in a big spot of light, you know there's one protein molecule right in the center of that flash of light. So you just can put a dot right in the center of that flash of light. You know, even though it's blurred, there's going to be one protein molecule in the center of that flash. Then you do it again, build up the picture, and now you get a single molecule resolution picture of where every protein molecule is. Just like how a helicopter flies, it doesn't change the law of gravity or the laws of physics, it's just a trick by which you get a, a, a microscope that beats the fundamental law of physics. Really, Eric's braveness is, is really, as well as the brilliant idea, it's also thinking. You know, everyone else is thinking, well, there's a fundamental law of physics, of course you can't build a microscope that that beats this law of, of light. But then it's just thinking, maybe there is a trick I could do that could get around that. So he builds that in his uh, living room. It goes to NIH, et cetera, yada, yada. It's a commercial instrument. We can buy it. We have three of them in my lab. They're about a million pounds each. And now we're looking at how the immune system works using these kinds of microscopes that see better than the fundamental law of physics. This is uh, a natural killer cell straight out of someone's blood, and it's sticking to um, a cancerous cell. And we know which few protein molecules are needed for your immune cell to see that the other cell is cancerous. Um, and we know which few atoms are important, in fact, from site-directed mutagenesis work and crystal structures and things like that. But still, when an immune cell sticks to another cell and it's got to decide whether it's healthy or diseased, what exactly is happening over those five minutes that it makes a decision? Uh, although we know which protein molecules are important, what is exactly going on? And so using these kinds of microscopes, we show that the protein molecules important in how the immune system sees the cancer cell are moving up to the contact between the two cells. When there's an organization to that, then, and then this immune cell will decide that the other cell is, is, is uh, diseased, and then it will try, and then it will go and kill the cancer cell. So this is um, using these new kind of microscopes. This is, if you were like the, the cancer cell, um, and so you're looking face on onto an immune cell that's going to try and kill you. 
And so behind the screen would be the rest of the immune cell, and that's like at the interface between the two cells. Now this is the cytoskeleton of the cell, so it's the thing that gives a cell its shape and it allows cells to move. And what's got to happen for the immune cell to kill the cancer cell is that those uh, red packets there inside the, inside the immune cell, they contain toxic proteins, and they've got to move, those red dots have got to move through this meshwork of actin, the cytoskeleton, to deliver the, the toxic molecules into the cancer cell. We could only see that with these kinds of microscopes that go right back to a guy working on jellyfish in the 70s, right? So what happens is when the immune cell is switched on to kill, though the, that meshwork opens up. So if you imagine it as like the inside bit of a tennis racket, then when the immune cell is going to kill, the squares get bigger. And that's just colored here. So the, we've colored the gaps between the lines of that skeleton of the cell, the cytoskeleton of the cell, and when the cell is going to kill, they, get, they move apart. There are bigger holes. Now the immune cell can kill. So the lines move apart to allow the red dots to move through and kill the diseased cell. My dad has multiple myeloma, and he is given a, a, a drug called Revlimid, or, or, uh, or, or lenalidomide is its uh, proper name. It's derived from thalidomide, which you would know as causing one of the greatest tragedies in all medical history, because when it was given to, um, uh, uh, as a sedative, essentially, to pregnant women, it called untold numbers of deaths and deformities. But it was also noticed that thalidomide had an anti-cancer property. So the company here made a slightly less toxic version of thalidomide, and that's given as revenue to uh, patients with multiple myeloma. Because it was discovered in that way as a sort of observation that this drug has an anti-cancer property, no one really knows exactly how it works. So we took this drug and we added it to our cells in a dish and we used the microscopes to look at what does this drug really do. And what we observed was that when you add that drug to immune cells killing cancer cells, that meshwork of actin, those, those, those colored squares between the lines, they open up even more to allow the NK cell, to allow the immune cell to kill the cancer cell much more efficiently. So using the microscopes allow us to understand how a medicine works when that medicine was basically discovered sort of anecdotally. I'm at a conference in a bar and I'm talking to a guy from the NIH, Konrad Krzyzewski, and he's working on a rare genetic disease um, where children suffer recurrent infections that often uh, sadly die quite young. He showed me that those immune cells from those children are not very good at killing virus-infected cells or other types of diseased cells. He had been studying those, the immune cells from those children, and one thing he observed was that the gene that's deficient in those children is somehow involved in the trafficking of membrane in cells, and so those red compartments that contain the toxic molecules used to go and kill a disease cell, they're much bigger than normal. They contain the same proteins, but they're just much bigger. We had a drug that we observed in cancer patients opened up that meshwork more, maybe that would allow the, the immune cells from the children to kill uh, better. We couldn't, I'm not a medical doctor, I, my PhD is in physics, um, and so we couldn't, I can't treat children, but I could, we could get blood from children and we could show that the, the, the cancer drug could be, uh, in at least in a lab dish, help the cells from the, the children kill uh, infected cells or cancer cells more efficiently. So you've got a story where the technology was developed, we could see how a drug worked, understanding the mechanism of that drug allowed us to use it in a totally different type of situation, which is a, a rare genetic disease. Um, there are many other new technologies being developed that you will know about that are very exciting, pushing everything forward. This is, um, for example, how we analyze cells now. You, you can see very clearly a cell could be defined by just a couple of labels, say, uh, some of A and none of B, or, or uh, by two, two markers. Now we can do that across whether all the genes are going, uh, every single of the 23,000 genes are being up or down regulated, and we can create sets of cells that use gene sets similarly to, to identify new kinds of cells. On a nasal swab, you can do that, and you can understand all the cells that are at the end of that nasal swab, and you can look which of them are infected. This is a way of analyzing cells that will enter into medicine down the line at some point in the same way that you have a data cloud of other types of information about you. In my own lab, the next step for us is to use these kinds of microscopes to understand the cells of the human body in a different way. Instead of looking which genes are being expressed or which protein markers they have, what do they do in response to seeing some kind of danger like, the, like a cancer cell? 
So we take a, the immune cells from the blood, we put them on a slide that's coated in a, in a protein molecule that would normally signify cancer. We leave them for a bit. They would secrete stuff like that red dot of toxic molecules as if they were trying to kill a cancer cell. We then add a pulse stain just to mark where they were, take the cell off, and now look at everything that it's, that it's secreted. We can only do this with the microscopes that see in, in, in incredible resolution what every cell is doing in response to that stimulation. Uh, so that's what it looks like, and that allows us a totally different way. This is the kind of image you would see for sort of gene analysis. But instead, this is looking at cells in terms of what they send out in response to a cancer cell, and that allows us to define new populations of cells that we didn't know were there before by analyzing what it is that they're doing in response to some kind of stimulation. For me, Heinrich Hertz in, in, in 1887, you know, he was looking at Maxwell's equations and eventually did the experiment that showed uh, waves that we uh, cannot see. He died at age 36. He could never have known that the waves he couldn't see would lead to the internet and TV. For me, this is where we are in human biology, that very basic things are opening up. It seems incredibly basic that we can identify new kinds of immune cells by what they secrete, what they send out in response to a, a, a signature of cancer, for example. I haven't had time to speak about the microbiome, the brain, the embryo, all sorts of things uh, which, are, which I've read about. Were essentially, new technologies on the kind of journey I've just given you are opening up new worlds in the human body, and they are going to affect our lives deeply in ways that we cannot even imagine yet. Thanks for listening.